In this video, we are going to talk about six fearful avoidant attachment style triggers with examples. <laughs> I am Pauline and I am so happy you are here because getting triggered as a fearful avoidant is super confusing if you don't know what's happening. So first of all, when you get triggered, what can happen is that you come in what I call a crash state, which is pretty much when your fearful avoidant attachment style is triggered to the max. And for a fearful avoidant, that is very confusing. The other two insecure attachment styles have crash states too, but they are a little bit more straightforward and always the same. For the fearful avoidant, it can be on the one hand that you are um, having the really active form of fear. So the active form of crash state, which means you just start pleasing and you start getting a lot of energy and, and unrest that you have to figure this out and have to solve this which can lead to pleasing but it can also lead to um, obsessive thinking so when you are in a um in a healthy relationship sometimes this leads to obsessive thinking about whether this relationship is right whether you are feeling enough whether you are in love enough um, and what can also happen and it can flip-flop between the two very rapidly is that you just shut down completely and that you don't feel anything anymore. Um, you might even get really tired, like extremely tired so that you can't even walk or, or talk anymore. Um, so it, it can be either one of those or it can be, uh, it can go one way or another. I can do a whole different, um, <coughs> excuse me. A video on crash states because it's very interesting and especially for the fearful avoidant it's very valuable to know what your crash state is and to recognize it so if you're interested in a video on that specifically let me know in the comments and i will put it on the list and, and make a video on that but for now we are diving into the six fearful avoidant triggers uh, with examples these are mostly deactivation triggers so that may, means you are going to deactivate, which means pushing your partner away. And sometimes the triggers are not straightforward. It's not always your partner coming too close, for instance, or um, uh, yeah, that, that is a very common trigger to push someone, someone away. But it's also pretty other random things that are hard to connect to your partner or to relationships or to love. One of those, I guess, unexpected triggers, for instance, is the feeling of being dumb or incapable or irresponsible. And it could be that you guys are just talking about something and you say something that is not right. Like you, you're watching the news and you get the capital of a, of a, a, a country wrong. And your partner makes a remark, on that not even being snide or or mean just that it's wrong that can fully trigger your uh, fearful avoidant attachment style if that is a belief that you have that when you're dumb that's really bad and you have to you have to be smart to be worthy of love and so what can happen is you're watching the news you make a remark your partner says something and you just get super angry at your partner that could happen and you don't really know why all of a sudden these thoughts come flooding in that try to put your partner down that make him seem less desirable that maybe focus on his appearance or on the fact that his nose is too big or crooked or just really small things to make him or her less than you just to feel a bit of control and security again and it can happen out of nowhere if you don't know that this is actually quite a big trigger for fearful avoidance. And it's mostly a trigger for fearful avoidance leaning dismissive. So you always lean either anxious or dismissive. Because um, this is also a trigger for the dismissives. Uh, because in a way you relate love and being worthy of love with a performance and being smart or... Uh, pretty or in whatever way you have to keep up a certain standard to be worthy of love and attention and then when you feel dumb you can relate that you can associate that with not being worthy of love and so you start to deactivate so that is one trigger 
Interesting, huh? Did you know this? Let me know in the comments. I'm curious whether you've already uh, figured this one out. Um, the second trigger is feeling vulnerable. This is a big one because feeling vulnerable for a lot of FAs was not safe in childhood. Um, and it, a lot of FAs actually have the experience that when they were vulnerable and they shared things or they did things or they said things from a vulnerable space, that was actually used against them at a later stage, at a later moment. Um, so being vulnerable is like the more vulnerable I am, the more you can hurt me. So I'm not going to do that. So being vulnerable can be when you share things and what a lot of FAs, maybe some FAs, I'm, I'm not quite sure of the percentage, but what FAs can do is that they're actually very vulnerable in a first contact. So you meet somebody, you're uh, at a party somewhere talking to someone and you can be very vulnerable. I, I remember this, if you want an example, <laughs> um, I worked at um, a company for a little bit and my boss who was actually one year younger than me because it was like an online marketing um, company. So it was all young people. He reminded me looking back on it a lot of my dad he he was a little bit judgmental and um definitely emotionally unavailable and he just triggered a lot like i i felt like i really had to perform and do well for for him and we were going to this company event and i happened to be in the car with him and um alone in the car with him and during that ride of like 15 minutes all of a sudden i just started telling him about my whole past and about my family what just all kinds of family things issues history and uh, that i don't usually tell people and i remember after that that company event i i went home and i just felt so icky i just felt so I was like, why did I tell him all of that? And he was he was kind about it, he was nice about it, but I was just so afraid that he still thought I was weird and that I told him so much and that the things that I told him were weird too. And oh, that just tripped me up for days afterwards, maybe even weeks. And um, so that was me feeling vulnerable and then going into a crash state and I, I avoided him like, no other <laughs> for the days afterwards when we were at work um, and that's what a lot of FAs do when they feel vulnerable they just retreat real quick <laughs> after that which is very confusing for the other person because it could be that you just have somebody that's completely open to that and and just values you sharing that and um, then wants to build whatever a friendship or a relationship with you um, but you felt vulnerable, so you got triggered, so you just pull back real quick. And uh, that can make the other people feel, or the other person feel like you ghost them, which is not a great feeling. Uh, but you don't do that on purpose. That just happens because you get triggered. So that could be feel, feeling vulnerable, but, but it could also be feeling weak vulnerable. So I also was triggered so often when I felt uh, tired or sick. and. I guess looking back, it's it's obvious that I wasn't allowed to feel tired or sick when I was younger. I had to like rough it and just keep going. Um, maybe you recognize that too. And so when I felt vulnerable or sick, um, I the fearful avoidant attachment style got triggered because I was afraid that Ari and my now husband, uh, then boyfriend, would not take me seriously would think I was just over exaggerating, um, would think I was, well, not worthy of love, essentially. Um, so he would reject me. So what I did was when I started feeling vulnerable or, or um, weak by being sick or tired, I would push him away. I would start thinking mean thoughts. I would start picking fights. I would just um, retreat physically into another room so that he couldn't see me and I didn't notice that that happened I really genuinely thought that me being annoyed with him was something that he did it didn't occur to me that I was actually not feeling very well at that moment 
And so I was looking for something, searching for something to be able to push him away. So when I started affirming to myself that it's okay to be sick, it's okay to be tired um, and still receive love. And when I started healing that more and more, I was able to stay um, in contact, in connection, in the same room as him without thinking mean thoughts. So um, that is that can definitely be a trigger of uh, the fearful avoidant attachment style, feeling weak and vulnerable in whatever way. Another, another fearful avoidant attachment trigger is uh, the moment of connection or a moment of deep relaxation. Because connection is very scary for the fearful avoidant. It's, it's almost the core of the fearful avoidant attachment style that you want connection, but you're afraid of connection. So you pull people closer and then you push them away when they get too close. And the getting too close part is usually the moment that you feel connected to them. And that might sound a little bit weird, but that it's actually a, a moment that you can feel when you're attuned to it. You can feel the moment of connection. So I um, read this story once um, in a book by David Schnarch called Passionate Marriage that he would show this moment of connection. Um, and I, I might have mentioned this before. Um, and this was 20 years ago. He would teach at a school and he would want to demonstrate that moment of connection. So he would ask two guys to come up to the front of the class. And I'm saying this is 20 years ago because he literally wrote in the book, I made use of the prevailing homophobia to show a point, which I hope and I think is not the case anymore in this time, time and age. Um, but so 20 years ago, he would call these guys up to the front of the class and he would say to one guy, I want you to stroke the other guy's arm. And so the guy would start stroking, but like really quickly and mechanically. And he would say, okay, slow it down, slow it down, slow it down. And he said, there was always a point where the guys just jumped back and kind of like got scared because they felt that moment of connection and that frightened them. And the fearful avoidant has that, which has nothing to do with homophobia, um, but has that with partners. Just that moment of connection can be very frightening. And it could be that that's just, just because your parent had that too. So whenever you had that moment of connection with your parent, which babies and children seek out naturally, uh, that's the moment when your parent kind of got that jump scare and started lashing out or started pushing you away or started becoming critical. So you associate that moment of connection with pain and shame and guilt. And that's why that could be a trigger, which means that you have that jump scare and you push your partner away. So that's how the pattern just keeps repeating. And then also a moment of deep relaxation can also be a trigger because your system is just so used to being hyper vigilant and on all the time that it feels unsafe to completely relax. So there are quite some uh, fearful avoidance that have a lot of problems sleeping, uh, either falling asleep or waking up in the middle of the night in fear and sometimes even in panic or waking up in the morning with fear and panic because sleep feels so vulnerable, feels so um, as if you're letting all control go. And that's what fearful avoidance do not like uh, or your fear brain doesn't like because you feel like you always need to be in control and always on and alert and know what might happen and be prepared to fight essentially. Um, so a moment of deep relaxation, whether it is with your partner or by yourself, can actually be a trigger for the fearful avoidant attachment style, which is crazy, right? I mean, oh, you're, you deserve deep relaxation. You deserve rest. Your body deserves rest and deep relaxation. So oh, I, I, really, I really wish that for you. And maybe just knowing this, it can help you to breathe a little deeper and just stay, stay in that relaxation a little bit longer. Another trigger is the possibility of hurting someone else or someone else's feelings. So the fearful avoidant usually has a very um, big moral sense of when 
you hurt somebody and when you don't. And actually, I think a lot of fearful avoidance are just always afraid that they will hurt people, whether they do something or whether they don't do something. So just the possibility of hurting someone can cause uh, a fearful avoidance to be triggered and go into a crash state, which can mean that you retreat completely and not even try because you were already in that shame spiral before anything even happened. So a concrete example of that is that a lot of um, the people, I was going to say girls, but I, I hope it's 50-50 now with guys and girls. Um, so a lot of the people that go through my Dutch program um, for the for the fearful avoidant attachment style, they a lot of them have this thing where they get triggered when they start thinking about the future. So when they start thinking about what if I find out he or she is not the one after we've been married or after we've bought a house or after we've got children. Um, and then when we kind of like peel the layers back on that, uh, it's just, well, then I have to hurt them even more. So it's almost like the logic of I might as well just break up now when I haven't done that much damage yet, because as we go on, um, it will only get worse and worse. And what if I have to hurt his or her feelings then after we've got married, after we've got a house together or after we have, have children and there are even more people involved. So the possibility, even if it's far in the future of hurting someone's feelings can absolutely trigger your fearful avoidant attachment style and um, cause you to seek 100% security, control uh, and certainty, which means you could really get really picky on everything in your relationship that has to be 100% perfect just so that you have that feeling of control or certainty that you won't hurt anybody's feelings and of course this is this doesn't work <laughs> and that's not the way to go about it because um you get to trust yourself it's okay to trust yourself and it's okay to trust that between now and then there's so many more days and, and weeks and months of you investing in the relationship and of you healing and um, and figuring things out together. So you are not powerless. It's not like you have to be absolutely certain now. And when you're certain now, that's like a certainty that you will have forever. No, you get to trust yourself that you will always find solutions and that you will always learn and grow and um that you will you will find a way so that helps <laughs> but that's definitely yeah also a trigger then the fifth one the trigger of the fear of doing something wrong or having done something wrong oh that's a very big trigger also and and that could be a state that you're like perpetually in which makes it really hard so there are um, fearful avoidance that are just in the crash state constantly that are just constantly in that panic mode pretty much and a lot of times this feeling of I'm always doing something wrong um, that we actually tapped on in an earlier video um, I'll link it down in the description um, that will cause you to just be um, in that crash state all the time and um, and that belief is under, under that. Sorry, I didn't finish that sentence probably, I think. But the belief of I'm always doing something wrong is, is driving a lot of that crash state, um, perpetual crash state. So when you start healing that, um, you will notice more space and more lightness and more um, ease and, and rest and calm and peace, which I all want for you so badly. Um, so that's definitely a trigger too. And then the last one um, is other people getting angry. And that's a very, very clear one. And that could lead to a few things. When you're still in your fight mode, that will lead you to fight. Like you will pick a fight, you will go at it um, and be emotionally volatile. When you start healing and you start feeling more and more vulnerable, it could lead to getting triggered and feeling that little kid, that little girl, that little boy inside um, just being in panic mode because getting, having somebody be angry at you was not safe when you were younger and you probably experienced that uh, on more than one occasion. So 
you just retreat, you either start pleasing or start doing anything to not make that person mad or you push the person away and you just stop talking, you stop doing anything just to not make it worse, not make that person more angry. Um, so it could go either way. Um, but that's definitely, definitely a trigger. And sometimes it can even be that the other person isn't, isn't angry, isn't remotely angry, but you are so hypervigilant that you interpret that as angry. There was a, a study done once where people that were abused when they were younger, and I think they were actually, pretty much all of them were fearful avoidant, um, had to look at faces of people that were just neutral. So there were a lot of pictures of people that were asked to have just a neutral face, just no emotions. Um, and the, the um, research participants that had experienced abuse had to rate them, whether they thought they were angry or not, and to what extent. And they also asked that with securely attached individuals. And um, there was a big difference between those two groups. The, the people who experienced abuse saw a lot more angry people, even though they were neutral, but just interpreted their faces as being angry way more than securely attached. So a lot of the signs you pick up in being hypervigilant might actually not be um, truth, might not be um, the thing your fear brain makes it out to be, namely them being angry. Uh, and I notice that sometimes even still a little bit with my husband who never ever gets angry, but sometimes he's just a little bit frustrated and that still is like, a, there's just the tiniest bit of like uh, left. And maybe that's just a normal human, human reaction of, you know, frustration or anger on, on your partner's part. But um, yeah, people getting angry definitely is a trigger, even if you just think they are getting angry, which is not always uh, even the case. All right. So these were six fearful avoidant um triggers with examples i tried to make them as concrete concrete as possible um and i really hope they were valuable did you learn new triggers was that just did you have any like eye openers let me know in the comments below i always want to hear i always want to hear from you and also how do you handle um being triggered or what do you notice are triggers for you that can put you in a crash state and let us know in the comments below so we can help each other and know that we are not alone i am so incredibly happy you're here if you want to know more you can watch these videos um and yeah let me know in the comments below 